And I think it became incredibly clear to me during COVID when, I don't know if you saw this, but I sort of felt like a lot of my colleagues who might have been studying liver disease or metabolic disease or, I don't know, neurodegenerative disease, all of a sudden were becoming COVID scientists. And the reason for that was so clear, right? There was just all this money flowing in, in the form of both government and non-government grants. And so if you put a big pot of money in front of people, they're going to do what they need to do to get that pot of money. Not otherwise specified has always been one of my favorite phrases in medicine. Not just because it's a fancy way of saying we don't really understand the root cause of something, but also because it captures the human impulse to put tidy labels on things that remain largely unknown. In NOS, I talk with some of medicine's most innovative thinkers to probe some of these messy unknowns behind our healthcare system, its players, and the stories that shape their lives. NOS makes time for the types of in-depth conversations that may not leave us with easy answers, but that shed fresh light on medicine's toughest challenges, as well as the people envisioning its future. I'm Lisa Rosenbaum, and you're listening to Not Otherwise Specified from the New England Journal of Medicine. My guest today is Ethan Weiss. He's a preventive cardiologist with interest in the genetics of coronary disease, risk assessment, and heart disease in young people. He's a scientist who is focused on using genetic models to elucidate the mechanism of metabolic disorders and on finding novel ways to block blood clots without causing increased bleeding. He's also an entrepreneur who has recently left his academic position at the University of California, San Francisco, to pursue a business opportunity. Ethan has an unusual ability to look at any issue from many different perspectives, and for the past eight years or so, he and I have been having the kinds of conversations about medicine that often feel difficult within the unwritten rules that govern discourse on social media. I recently talked with Ethan about his long love affair with academic research, what motivated his recent move to industry, incentives and changes in both of those domains, the risk of life as a self-appointed COVID expert, or any kind of expert, on social media, and his family's ongoing and very personal debate about the ethics of gene editing. So Ethan, welcome to the podcast. I thought we should start by talking a little bit about how you landed where you are. So talk a little bit about what got you into science and then more recently into industry. So I, you know, I was probably one of uh, 10 or 15 non-science majors, humanities majors in, uh, in my medical school class. And, you know, it was even worse than that, right? Like if you were a biology major at Hopkins at that time in the early 1990s, you were considered soft. And uh, so I struggled mightily with, with medical school, especially first year. Back then, we shared our curriculum entirely with the first year graduate students. So there really was, it was the same classes, same lectures, same people, same material. And it was all assumed that people had heard this stuff for the fifth or sixth time, and I had been hearing it for the first time. So I went to but the dean of students at the time, a guy named Frank Herlong, who was an important figure in my life. Um, and I, you know, I basically said, I think I'm going to fail out. And he said, no, you'll be fine. Uh, just kind of get your way through it. And I said, well, what do you think I should do? He said, well, why don't you spend this next summer between first and second year working in a lab? Because I think it'll help you kind of grasp some of these concepts that you're missing and slow things down for you. And so I went through this sort of exercise. Now, again, my dad was on the faculty there at the time, had been there for a long time. And so we had a lot of connections. And so I started calling these connections, asking if I could work in their lab over the summer. And, and I got like six or eight straight no's. And because, of course, what did they want to do with me? I was this undergraduate, you know, humanities major from Vassar, and they the, was failing out of medical school. So I finally <laughs> got uh, finally got somebody to agree to let me come. He was a young assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry because I was interested in neuroscience and psychiatry at the time. And, and uh, he gave me a project. And I had almost a sort of love at first moment experience. I really just I truly fell in love with the experience and the environment and the people and the concepts and uh, felt almost like what today in my life feels like cooking. It was very meditative and I just enjoyed seeing the way things you know worked and looking at the output and 
So I came, I came back to, to Frank Herlong and I said, that was great. I think I'm going to drop out of medical school and go to graduate school. <laughs> and he said, you know, why don't you take a few deep breaths? And um, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. And he said, why don't you take a year off between third and fourth year and go back and work in a lab and see if you really love it. And then you can kind of go from there. So I did that. I took the year between third and fourth year. And by that point, I had sort of become enamored with or interested in cardiology. So I found a lab that was doing cardiology research and um, and went and spent a year there. It ended up being almost two years by the time you added up all this sort of time on either end and the time it took to write manuscripts. And that experience was spectacular. That was actually, uh, and and I didn't have any idea how, how unusual it was. So this is really my second experience ever walking into a lab. And by the end of the first month, we basically had written or I had written a draft of a manuscript. And then, uh, you know, by the end of the first year, we had a second manuscript that we ended up submitting and finally ending up getting published in the New England Journal of all places. And wow. it was actually a really fun uh, experience. And, and I, I knew at that point I was going to spend my life doing science. And so uh, I just had to figure out what the clinical match to that science experience was going to be. And I guess probably because of de default or because of genetics or something, I, I ended up deciding to do cardiology. So I, I decided to do cardiology. I ended up doing my medicine residency at Hopkins and then had to get out of there. I was just been there for too long and uh, too many ghosts and other things going on. So I uh, was looking around for a place where I could really get an in-depth experience in, in a lab that had something to do with cardiovascular medicine or biology and asked a bunch of people and, you know, nine out of 10 people said the same name. They said, you got to go work to San Francisco and work with this guy, Sean Coughlin. Uh, and so I, you know, came out and interviewed, loved him. They liked me. And so I moved out here in the summer of 1998 to do my cardiology fellowship. And I really spent the first three years in the lab and didn't do any clinical medicine. So you go to UCSF, you spend three years doing science. And then more recently, and I know this is something you and I have been talking about for eight or 10 years, I think, you've, you've made more of a leap into industry. So can you talk a little bit about sort of your scientific career and then how you've been weighing whether or not to stop working in a lab and spend more time in industry and, and what finally made you make that leap? Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, when I was working at Hopkins, I was working in human genetics. Uh, I was not ever trained as, as a geneticist, but but I was using the tools we had then. When I came to UCSF, I started working on mouse genetics. I was trying to get more mechanistic. I think I had this idea because I hadn't gone to graduate school, didn't have a PhD that I needed to be more rigorous and wanted to get more mechanistic. And so worked in in mouse models. At the time, you know, you could, it was sort of still new in the era of mouse genetics where you could manipulate the mouse genome and you could knock out proteins or you could knock, knock them in, or you could make, you could do all kinds of diff different fun things. And so uh, that was sort of how I started my lab. I started my lab intending to, to focus on thrombosis, which was, you know, obviously related to, to heart attacks and strokes and through a series of kind of accidents of biology ended up kind of pivoting into metabolism and, and had a really fun, I would say, um, somewhat productive experience running a lab for whatever that was, 15, 16, 17 years. And I think, you know, we made good contributions. I am absolutely not a great scientist and never have been. And I also started to get this sort of itch about the lack of connection between the work we were doing and the potential to help human beings. And it felt like the work we were doing while it was interesting was really of interest to kind of a very small number of people in the world and had the unfortunate reality of being unlikely to be translatable into a treatment or a drug or an understanding of disease mechanism. So I, I started to get this kind of unease around wanting to be more directly impactful on, on human health. And I'd always been interested in industry. I'd been interested in developing drugs. I sort of thought it was an interesting place where you really could directly impact a lot of lives. And, you know, biology has had this astonishing pace of progress over the past, whatever you want to say, 40 years, but particularly the past 15 or 20 years. And so I felt like 
uh, it was something that I would want to do. I just never found the right thing to do. So I was approached by a mentor of mine two plus years ago about getting involved in uh, helping him kind of build a concept for a potentially for a new um, a new biotech company. And he he asked, he said, would you like to help? And I said, sure. And so I started off really just initially consulting and then sort of it became more and more over a period of time to the point where as of July 1st, 2022, I, I basically resigned my position at UCSF and am now working full-time to build this new company. I, I maintain a very small clinical practice. So I'm a you know, volunteer physician kind of at UCSF and I do a little bit of consults, but I'm mostly out of, out of that world and into a new world. And do you think that no matter what, you would have made that evolution or were there things that were happening in academic medicine that you think pushed you away? It's always the push pull. And all I can say in a simple way is that I felt like I wasn't going to want to wake up in 20 years doing the same thing, that I had this intense desire to do something different. I actually considered several other other things. I had a couple of sort of false starts and but I think I knew I was going to leave. And then at the same time, there was just this other thing happening, which was the world of academic medicine that I had grown up in seemed different to me. And um, it felt, um, it just felt yucky. I do feel like the world of academic science and academic medicine has gotten tangled up in what I perceive to be perverse incentives. And I think I started to wonder how much of what we all do was driven by an intrinsic desire to do good or to solve problems versus just checking the boxes, right? Getting papers published, getting grants. It felt like there was this incredibly strong emphasis on metrics, both in clinical medicine and, and in even in the academic on the science side. And the metrics, you know, the metric that sort of seemed most relevant and most important on the science side was, was, you know, what's your, uh, how much, in, how much an indirect cost return are you getting? I mean, how many, how many grants do you have and how much money is coming back into the institution? And I, I felt like we as an institution and maybe even we as a, as a sort of greater group of academic scientists and physicians lost our sense of mission. And that was, I think, unsettling to me. Do you think that the sense of mission is more clear in industry? Yeah. And how, how do you, because it's sort of ironic, right? We talk so much about the perverse incentives of, of industry, which are obviously profit. And in some ways, I find the industry incentives easier to deal with because they're just so transparent. So we all know that that any company wants to earn a profit. And so you can interpret data accordingly. Um, you can interpret study design accordingly. But the incentives that you're talking about in academia, I think, tend to be more obscure. I often think that we we don't talk a lot about how science is motivated by the need to get grants, the need to get published, et cetera. Is that something that resonates with your experience or not? Yeah, it does. I, I think it's true that the Obviously, if you're a publicly traded company, you have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders to maximize their value. And I think most of the people at these companies are motivated by wanting to do good for, for human health and even the executives, but they also have an awareness that they can't continue to function if they don't, uh, if they don't do that other you know, sort of financial fiduciary job. In academics, I think it probably used to be that way. But it definitely felt to me like it was a little bit more the what we're doing part of it is not nearly as important as that we're able to check all the boxes. And I think it became incredibly clear to me during COVID when I don't know if you saw this, but I sort of felt like a lot of my colleagues who might have been studying liver disease or metabolic disease or I don't know, neurodegenerative disease all of a sudden were becoming COVID scientists. And the reason for that was so clear, right? There was just all this money flowing in 
in the form of both government and non-government grants. And so if you put a big pot of money in front of people, they're going to do what they need to do to get that pot of money. That that was sort of the sense. And maybe that's too cynical. And I'm not saying that there is nobody in academic science who's not oriented the, the right direction. I just felt like overall as a culture, it felt like the the direction was the wrong direction. And we see again and again examples of of this, you know, showing up where, you know, papers get retracted, people are making up data. I mean, there's all kinds of things. I think pe- people, anyway, overall, that was sort of my sense. It's very personal to me. I certainly don't want to make an indictment. I, I'm very aware that there are a lot of young people who want to devote their careers to academic medicine and science. And I certainly don't want to discourage them from doing it. It's just, this is how I felt. And I think I'm unusual because I myself had been in it for so long, but I also had grown up in it. So basically every waking memory I ever had was around this world. And so I have a lot of scar tissue and I've got my own, I've got my dad's and, you know, everything else I saw along the way. Yeah, I don't think you're indicting all of academic medicine. I think you're hitting on this issue that actually is completely parallel to what's happening in clinical medicine as well, which is that you take people who are mission driven and want to do right by their patients and want to make the world better genuinely. And then you stick a bunch of incentives in front of them, whether they're quality metrics or RVU incentives or whatever it is, how we get paid. And it seems to undermine the mission and also leads to, I think, a lot of of burnout. So I know that's something that you and I have talked about a lot, but is that something that you also felt like you were witnessing on the clinical side? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt the same creep of these metrics that happened on the science side was happening on the clinical side. It was maybe even worse. But I'm I'm also cognizant that these institutions have to pay the bills, right? Like they have to exist. I think, you know, if you want to get into the really deep nitty gritty that these nonprofit organizations had built themselves up to be these behemoth, you know, monsters and and had incredible financial pressures, both on the clinical and the academic side that they had to meet. And so it's not surprising then that somebody came in and said that you need to maximize your your profit or your financial return. The reality is that probably went too far on both ends and and probably took this experience that I used to find joy in and, and made it not joyful anymore. Do you think there's anything we can do? <laughs> I mean, this is basically when I write this is what I come up against every single time, which is that medicine is this profit-driven enterprise now. It seems the root ill of everything else that's going wrong, and I have no idea how to fix it. You know, it's funny. And on the clinical side, the, <laughs> and I got, I've gotten into trouble for saying this because I think it's counterintuitive and maybe even paradoxical, but we have... Uh, you know, there's been this prolifer- prolifer- proliferation here in San Francisco. I'm sure it's the same in Boston and New York, other big cities of these concierge medical practices. And in a weird way, and it's and look, don't get me wrong. This is for the elite of the elite, like the 0.1 of the 0.1 percent. These are incredibly expensive programs, products uh, that have not accidentally attracted the best doctors. But But what they've done is put these doctors in a position where they don't have to they pay them a decent salary, maybe even a good salary, but then they take all that other stuff away, right? So that those doctors are then not expected to worry about billing or compliance or any of those other things. They just take care of patients, which is probably the way it was, you know, in the old days. And I think what I see from those physicians is is a love and a joy of practicing medicine that I don't see a lot of other places. Uh, and again, I think while that model is certainly not portable and not uh, something that you could immediately apply to a, an entire society, I think there are elements of it that probably we can learn from. And I hope we can, I hope we do learn from because to me, the difference is, is stark. Yeah. And it definitely feels like what we're doing isn't sustainable if for no other reason that the workforce is so unhappy and 
it seems like if the workforce is unhappy, then we're not going to attract the best and brightest from society to to become doctors. And society needs that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's I don't to answer your first question. I don't have an answer because I don't think again, I, it's not you can't take you know, make a concierge model of work for the whole world or for the whole country. But there is something, I think there's probably a lesson there for people who are a lot smarter than I am. There's probably a lesson there for what it is that makes that experience so good for both the physicians and the other clinicians in this practice and for the patients. You know, it's funny, Elon Musk obviously is like a, um, you know, toxic um, radioactive name these days, but uh I thought it was interesting that when he started, at least my understanding, of when he started Tesla, he started the first car they made was the Roadster, which was like a million dollars. And obviously only a handful of people in the world could afford to buy it. And his story was, or at least the way I heard it, was that he did that. He made this super expensive car as a sort of a, a, a foray into this thing and that he would use what he learned from that to be able to make affordable cars for, for everybody. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure how affordable Teslas are today, but but it was an interesting model, right? That you're going to sort of it's almost like you're going to, um, you know, tax the rich, right? You're going to sort of you're going to use them as a place where you're going to develop these new technologies uh, because they'll pay for these super expensive things. And then you'll sort of. Um, I don't know. Economists can probably tell you about it. right? I'm sure it was the same thing when when, when like plasma TVs first came out, right? They were probably only available to super rich people because they were too expensive. There's probably something for people who understand this. Uh, there's probably something to it, but that was sort of what I had imagined that maybe concierge medicine could serve like that, you know, the Roadster or, you know, an expensive TV from 1999. Yeah. I love that idea. I do feel I'm getting frustrated because everything I write, I just come up against the same problem, which is that everybody's unhappy, patients and doctors. And I I just, I don't see a way out, which I know is very cynical, but. It's, it's cynical. Uh, it's definitely <laughs> cynical. It, it, and it's hard not to go down this rat hole and, and feel like you can't get out. And, and that's not good, right? I, I think, um, as you said earlier, we need to inspire young people to want to, to, to follow this career and and I think uh, the last thing they need is to see people like you and me, you know, kvetching about how it's like not like it was in the old days and how it's like a miserable, non-mission driven experience. So I do feel some responsibility to try to maintain some positive spin on it. And by the way, I fully love the experiences I've had since I started in medical school in 1991, 31 years ago, it's been amazing. I mean, I love being a doctor more than anything. So the, I think my feeling of needing to save it comes from just this deep love of medicine still. And this idea of all that it can be. I think the, the reason I write, if I could say there's one reason I write is because like, I want medicine to be for everyone what it is for me, which is like this wonderful experience that I wouldn't trade for the world, you know? I think, you know, the big question for me, I've got, you know, two teenage daughters and the big question I get asked all the time is, would you recommend this career for your children? And, you know, independent of whether or not they would ever want to do it or whether or not they'd be right. I would very much. I think, uh, I'm hopeful because I did I did start medical school at a time when there was a perception that medicine was dying. It was sort of the era before that first, you know, sort of uh, attempt at, at real healthcare reform. But there was a sense among I remember distinctly to, uh, among my dad's peers and other people that medicine was sort of doomed and that there was tremendous unhappiness among practicing physicians at that time in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And so I remember thinking to myself, well, why am I doing this? But naively, I just thought, well, at some point, it's going to just get better. And obviously, for me, it did. I don't know if you go back and ask those people if it's better, if it ever got better from where they were in that period of time to now, or if it's worse now, it would be interesting to 
kind of ask for the ones who lived through it. But I do think it's reasonable to believe and to hope that that some of these things are going to get fixed. I also think that a lot of what we talk about is probably unique to, or at least um, highlighted in an academic center. And I do think academic centers, both on the research side and on the clinical side, are reaching a reckoning point that they're going to have to figure out. That mm-hmm. there's there's a, and I don't know enough about it to be able to speak wisely about it, but it feels like there's something going on here that is new and unique and bad and is true across every institution that we all know. That's that's a sense that I have. So I, I do think probably outside of these centers, it's, it's probably a little bit different. Um, but inside, it's it's an issue. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's certainly that the vibe I get, and I'm not sure how much the pandemic was a tipping point in that sense in terms of people feeling more exploited than they had even before. And I don't know enough about what's going on outside of academia, but I think when you look at burnout trends, it seems that, you know, everybody's affected and everybody's being asked to see more patients in less time and fill out more paperwork. And until we address those problems, I I just can't see how we're going to turn it all around. But I think that that what you raise is sort of, I I used to tell people that, you know, in academics, you didn't, again, it's all relative. So I'm, I'm saying this with self-awareness, you didn't get paid that well relative to your just colleagues in, in private practice or in, in industry. But what you got was was the sort of freedom to operate, that you didn't get poked a lot, uh, that you could do kind of whatever you wanted to. And, and you know, it's amazing that in my academic you know research career, I could basically study whatever I wanted to. As long as I was able to pay the bills, it was no one was ever going to ask me or tell me I couldn't do that or I couldn't study that. It was an incredible amount of freedom that I think we all really loved. Uh, it's probably a little bit unrealistic to think that that's going to exist that in that way forever. But I think what's changed in, in academic medicine, particularly over the past 15 years, is that the amount of poking that happens has gone up a lot. So, you know, you mentioned a couple of things, and obviously the EHR gets a, a really bad rep, but it's it's a big factor and I think it exposes this sort of reality that a lot of the work that we do, work we do, is really oriented towards a billing cycle event as opposed to trying to do what we can to take the best care of our patients. Can you talk a little bit about when you went to New York Presbyterian Hospital during COVID to volunteer? Because I think one thing that struck me about your time there was how a lot of those administrative requirements were swept aside and what that was like for you, what it looked like? I mean, it was great. It was, first of all, I wasn't, I was in a different institution. I didn't really know anybody and I knew I was only going to be there for a couple of weeks. And so I didn't have this like, not that I ever operated that way too much in a normal world, but I didn't have this fear of like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. And uh, I kind of a few times said to myself, well, if they don't like this, then they can just send me home. And that was obnoxious, but I was there obviously as a volunteer, and I think they were grateful to have me. And uh, but it was an amazing r- realization that the work I was doing was entirely 100% devoted to taking care of extraordinarily sick patients, and that everything else that we did got put aside. And that was it was almost like you know after being confined in a small cell for 25 years and then being able to walk out into nature. It was amazing. It felt. It felt so good. And we all felt that way. And I think that team sense of, hey, we're all here to do the same thing. It was so clear what we were there to do, right? It was, there was no mystery about it. Are we here to increase revenues? Are we here to be compliant? Are we here? It was, we're here to save lives. That was it. And it was stark because it was so different from what we had been experiencing what I'd been experiencing, you know, before. So, um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. I don't, unfortunately you can't exist that way, right? Like the hospital still, you know, for that period of time, they really did have a mission just to save those lives. But at some point they were going to, going to exist if they couldn't, you know, now start to recoup some of the financial things that, you know, if they couldn't start billing again. So it was living in some weird 
you know, utopian nirvana for a period of time that can't possibly exist. And so let's talk about what happened to you on the way home. So you <laughs> flew home and you were on the plane. And I think there had been promise from the airline, I think it was United, that there would be social distancing on the airplane, right? And again, this is like peak, peak, peak pandemic time. And you take a picture that I think went viral that showed that everybody was just sitting next to each other like normal. Is that is that right? Can you tell I, I want to hear a little bit about what yeah. happened, but I'm more interested in how it sort of changed your relationship to social media, because I, I yeah. really want to talk to you about that. There's a backstory, which is, um, you know, if you go back to that period of time in March of 2020, when COVID first showed up, we're, we're all trying to figure it out. And at that time, there were no COVID experts because there was no COVID. So I think those of us who were on, active on social media and then were scientifically literate and were curious dove in. And, you know, very early on, it was clear there were some people who were going to become sort of COVID experts on social media. And I definitely felt like at least for a period of time that that might be me because I had a, you know, I had a presence and uh, I felt like I could communicate fairly effectively. And so I definitely got sucked into this thing uh, hard. And actually, I wrote a uh, I wrote a piece on the plane on the way from San Francisco to New York. I wrote a piece that ended up getting published in, in one of these science blogs about what I was doing. And it was like totally self-indulgent. And um, in retrospect, it's like I, I'm embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed about it. But Ostensibly, it was sort of like how I'm, you know, making this great sacrifice to, you know, put my life on the line, leave my family behind and go to New York and save all these people. It was, <laughs> you know, it was, it was. Like vomit emoji. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really, uh, but I definitely got a lot of love for that, right? Like I got so much, if, I used to keep track of my Twitter followers over time. And like from that period of time, it was like a straight up line. And so then. I don't know if you remember, but there were the chair of surgery at Columbia. I can't. Remember, I think his name was Craig Smith. Was writing these like blog posts about life in that hospital in the spring of 2020, and they were magical, and people were completely blown away. And he uh, was like, you know, beloved because he was giving everybody this sort of inside view into what was happening in these hospitals. And by the way, no one else was allowed in the hospital. It didn't matter if you were, if you had. A, you know, relative dying there, or whatever it was, there was no one on the outside coming in. So people who were on the inside were able to tell these stories. And so I remember on the way, somebody said to me, I don't remember who it was, said, you should do one of these like blog things and like tell your story as you're there. And so every night when I got home from the hospital, after my shift, I would sit down at my computer and I'd write one of these things. And I there were probably a series of like 10 of them or something that I wrote. And of course, they got so much love and attention. And so like, I can't, I got done with this thing feeling like I was, I was a celebrity. Like I was like, this is amazing. I, I'm, this is amazing. Everybody loves me. I'm great. <laughs> and, and then I get on this airplane and yeah. So United had sent around this email a week before saying we value your health and like, we're all, we're going to keep, you remember they kept the middle seats blocked, which of course is like so silly, but at that time we didn't know. So and it felt comfortable to not have somebody sitting directly next to you for six hours on a transcontinental flight. And so we get on this flight and we had been told all along, like, they're going to keep the middle seats blocked. Da, 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 da. And there are a bunch of us coming back from being in New York, coming back to San Francisco. And then we get on the plane and all of a sudden every seat on the plane is full. And it just took everybody by surprise. And was a little bit of a shock. And so I, people were freaking out. And I, so I took this picture a selfie, right. And it basically showed the entire plane full of people. And I tagged United and basically quoted their email from whatever it was a week or two earlier saying they were going to block the middle seats. And I basically was like WTF. And <laughs> I didn't know what happened. I, I basically, you know, landed in San Francisco, whatever it was like six hours later. And I mean, I had like messages on my phone from CNN and local television and all these other people saying they wanted to come out and interview me. And and so I got my bag and got out of there. And 
I had to go and quarantine, you know, away from my family. Cause again, we had no idea, right. We, I didn't want to get them sick and we didn't know if we came back infected and I went and quarantined by myself for a few days and had this like incredible onslaught of media attention. <clears throat> and, um, basically through the incredibly strong personality and will of my wife, uh, who kind of at one point said to me, Ethan, who the hell are you? Like, who have you become? You are not the person that I married. Like, this is weird. And what's going on? And thankfully, she got through to me. And I realized, like, this is definitely not me. And so I kind of stepped away slowly and then more so from this idea that I was going to become like a COVID celebrity. Uh, and that was that. And when she said this isn't you, did she mean because there was this part of you craving the affection and love of all of society? Is that the part that stood out to her? Yeah, I mean, I think she... I mean, she married an introvert, right? Like, I think it's kind of funny. Some people don't believe it, but I I was a very introverted kid and stayed that way through college and got more confident and was able to, you know, function pretty well, but I'm still inherently an introvert. And she was like, what the hell is going on here? Like, who are you? And I think she was just sort of like, this is not the person, you are not the person that I've known for the past, whatever it was at that time, 20 years. And um, and I, mean, I think it woke me up that I was, it wasn't me. Like I was obviously responding to some, again, incentives. I was responding to this love and to this attention, which quite frankly felt amazing. And if it hadn't been for her saying to me, basically it's, you know, them or me, I think, you know, I have no idea what would have happened. I, I think I probably do know what would have happened because I'm not sure I would have had that insight or awareness to recognize it on my own. But thankfully, I have a very strong wife who kind of didn't let me not know it. So, And you actually helped a lot. We talked a lot back then. We talked a lot, yeah. but I understand the, the desire for attention. I also understand sort of when something is addictive, it's addictive. And I mean, it felt to me like when we were talking about it, like an addiction. And I think that's how it is for, for so many people. And, you know, can you talk a little bit though about how you pulled back and then what that was like for you? Oh, I mean, yeah, so it definitely was an addiction. And, and uh, in this case, it was, you know, I had an intervention the intervention was powerful, right? And, and I don't want to get too personal here, but my wife was very direct about what she said to me. In addition to sort of phrasing it and framing it as this is not you and I don't know who you are, she was very clear that it was not to her liking and that she felt like something weird had happened to me and that I had to get it together. So I had this very strong motivation to be able to, you know, put my family back together. And at that time I was still outside of my home. So it was even worse. It was kind right. of really scary. And so I had this, you know, sort of fear of, oh my God, I'm going to lose my family. And so it was kind of easy for me to say, I'm going to give up this like path to becoming Dr. Oz and <laughs> go back to being a normal person and, um, and have my family. But it was a really, really powerful thing. I mean, it was, uh, I, I've never done cocaine in my life, but I could imagine that it's probably similar to the first time one does cocaine. It was just euphoric. So you had this come to Jesus moment, but a lot of people didn't, right? And then, you know, we didn't know it at the time, but the pandemic is still going on in its own way, but certainly went on in a way that captivated the world for another two years or so. So... Can you talk a little bit about how having this realization in yourself sort of shaped what you perceived and the rest of the scientific and medical communities as others, some in a completely warranted way, you know, stepped up to communicate science to the public and some seemed to be a bit more opportunistic for lack of a better word? 
there was clearly an element of service there. I don't want, uh, there were people who, you know, Ashish, uh, Ashish Jha is a great example, right, of somebody who is a gifted communicator and at that time was providing a great service to humanity to be able to untangle this incredibly complicated web. And he, I think, net net was providing a good to the world at the same time he was providing a good to himself. And, and again, I love Ashish and I wish him nothing but the absolute best, but he's now in a position as a, you know, special advisor to the white house. He's like hanging out with Joe Biden as a direct result of the fact that he, you know, is on TV all the time talking about COVID. So I'm not criticizing Ashish at all, but that was this balance of sort of service to humanity and service to yourself. And at the time, I think, the service to humanity part felt like it was much more important. And you could forgive people for having a little bit of service to themselves because we needed it. And as I had said, there were really no COVID experts back then, or there were a handful of people who'd ever seen a SARS you know, virus, who had ever seen SARS. And but then over time, you know, as the pandemic wore on, I think it sort of at some point felt to me like, well, gosh. There are a bunch of people out there who understand epidemiology and infectious diseases and understand viruses. And at some point, maybe we should like give the keys of the car back to them. Like, I don't know why I as a cardiologist should be, you know, the one who's become an expert in an infectious disease pandemic. And for me, it was just, you know, once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. And so I, I... I felt like, you know, for me personally, I just had to, to to stop and go back to being talking about and thinking about and opining about things that I knew well and feel like I could be informed on. So you're getting at, I think, something that I really want to talk to you about and wanted to talk to you about, which is the way social media have changed scientific discourse and the nature of expertise and perverted, I think, our motivations in some ways that I don't think we've even begun to grapple with as a scientific community because I I don't even think that we understand them. And I think that you actually hit on this pre-pandemic. So you have expertise in metabolism and nutrition, and you wrote a stat news piece about tribalism in nutrition science. And I I read that again over the weekend. I read it when you first wrote it. And I was like, God, this is like a preview to all that was to come in terms of the science wars. So can you talk a little bit about nutrition science and how tribalism manifests and also the way you think social media contribute to that sort of scientific divide? Yeah, of course. I, the it's not unique to nutrition science. It's not really unique to anything, to be honest. It's 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 a function of of social media, particularly of Twitter. If I re- remember back to two thousand nine when I first joined Twitter, I had zero followers. Obviously, when I started, and at the beginning for the first four or five years, I probably had less than a few hundred. And so everything I said, I was basically saying to myself. But what was beautiful about Twitter at that time was that it was somewhat democratizing because you could get involved in conversations about really interesting things, in my case about science, with eminent leaders, right? I remember getting into a conversation with Jeff Flyer, who was the dean of Harvard Medical School at the time, and he would respond to me and many others. It wasn't you know just people who were in that kind of a position of leadership, but it felt like this was an incredible place where you could have a conversation, a meaningful, honest conversation. And... Uh, there were no consequences. And then, of course, as your follower count increases, the more everything you say actually is scrutinized and matters. And and then also, I think you begin to kind of understand the things that drive those increases in follower numbers. And it becomes a different thing, right? It becomes more about cultivating your own presence than it does a place where you can learn and teach and do all these other things. So I think Twitter is a funny place because almost by definition, it like it it becomes uh, impossible to sustain, right? It's almost by definition that you can't keep going. You can't just limit people to you know having a few hundred followers. It just wouldn't work. Uh, it's not that way anymore. Um, 
I think, you know, we've seen things right since the 2016 election about the sort of amplification of misinformation, whether it's scientific or otherwise. And, and that's definitely been a problem in nutrition science and cardiology and everything else. Loud voices can propagate bizarre, quacky conspiracy theories relatively easily and get rewarded for it. And uh, yeah, so there was a world of, you know, even before the pandemic where people were espousing what I would consider to be borderline conspiracy theories about, about you know, medicine or science. And uh, it was everywhere. Right? I mean, I had smart people, smart patients of mine coming to me saying, I read this. And they said that LDL cholesterol doesn't, isn't important for heart disease. And is that true? And it was a very strange time. So, yeah, we wrote this piece. The funny thing about that piece was uh, at the end of it, we the last paragraph, we said something about how the people who were promoting these sort of fringe views on any side of a nutrition debate were were reminded us of people who promoted fringe views on vaccines. And so we made that connection uh, and we got destroyed for it. Uh, so I wrote the piece with Nicola Guess, who's a uh, nutri- who's a registered dietitian, nutri- nutritionist, based in London. And I mean, the two of us might as well have like used a racial slur. It was like we were, how dare you, you know, call us vaccine deniers? What an abominable thing to do! And so we, I think, we ended up having to kind of apologize for it. And of course. It's funny because now three or whatever years later, if you went back and looked at those people who were yelling at us about sort of how dare you call us vaccine deniers, they all became vaccine deniers, like all, every one of them. And it was remarkable that the same group of people who were espousing these kind of fringe views on things like LDL cholesterol and um, other nutritional related things were the same people who then started to espouse fringe views about around vaccines. And it was like, it was like a weird prophecy. It was. I mean, that's, again, the feeling I have when I reread it this weekend. But I I also think that you're hitting on something that is so critical as we talk about this misinformation, disinformation problem we have, because the instinct so often is to say, well, just let's, let's put out better information. Let's put out correct information. And what you are identifying is something deeper. I don't know if it's a human nature problem. I don't know if it's a a certain personality that covets conspiracy theories or fringe beliefs, but I feel like we keep getting back to these sort of doomsday topics. But when you think about sort of what is the future of scientific expertise itself, it feels so... um, I guess, worrisome, because if you think about what science is, it's like saying, I don't know, it's admitting uncertainty, um, it's complexity, and none of these things sell on social media. Can we talk about something happy? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) Can we talk about Ruthie? Sure. So I think the first time that I interviewed you formally for a piece is um, when I wrote about CRISPR in 2018 after the Chinese scientist, he had CRISPRed babies for the first time, embryos, germline editing. And I reached out to you because your daughter, Ruthie, who at the time I think was 12, is she 16 now? Uh-huh. Uh, she has albinism and is legally blind, and it's a monogenetic disease, as far as I understand. Is that correct? Correct. And so a lot of ethical issues were raised as far as the potential for germline editing was concerned. But one of the many was, you know, does this mean that people are going to start editing out disability in their offspring? And so you and I talked about sort of how this would have affected your decision about whether or not to edit Ruthie's genome. Do you think if you had the option for germline editing, you would have edited her genome? And given that you didn't have that option and you have a daughter you adore, do you feel like that's something that you would have regretted? 
Yeah, obviously, I've thought about this whole thing a lot. And I have had the benefit of being able to discuss it with Ruthie a lot from the time she was a relatively young kid. I think even at the age of nine is when the first time we ever talked about this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, if somebody had come to me in 2006 before Ruthie was born and said, your kid has this monogenic condition uh, and you, she's going to end up with all these things. She's going to have super pale skin, hair, and she'll have, you know, a visual impairment such that she will never drive a car and all the other stuff that comes along with it. And here's an option for you to fix that. Would we have fixed it? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Like we wouldn't even have thought twice about it. In fact, I remember, and um, we'll never forget the day when I, you know, figured out that Ruthie had albinism and Palmer came home from work and I told her, and I'll never forget the reaction that she had. And it was, you know, frankly, one of, of just terror and, and fear and hopelessness and, yeah. So, you know, over the years, of course, there was no option for us to do anything other than to embrace and love the kid that we had, not the kid that we wanted to have or thought we were going to have. Uh, we, you know, sort of then began to entertain that there might be an option, not necessarily for us, but for future parents. And so it sort of began something that we would would think about. And by that point, Ruthie was, you know, a thriving member of her community and was bringing joy to everybody around her. And so it was one of these kind of existential questions, right? You know, if you could go back in time, would you f change it? Would that change her? Would that make her less special? Um, and like I said, you know, you can have these conversations or we can have these conversations and they're really fun to do, right? To sit around and, and talk about this stuff. But by that point, I could actually have these conversations with Ruthie. And like I said, she's now 16. I've talked to her about this for coming on seven years. And she's been fairly steadfast in her commitment to and belief that she is who she is and that she wouldn't change anything. It remains to be known whether she would, she'll always feel that way. She may at some point in her adult life decide that she doesn't feel that way, but she does very strongly believe that she is who she is and that she wouldn't ever want to go back and change it. It's interesting because she's now taking biology and they got into this discussion a little bit during her biology class this past semester. And she, we got into almost a little bit of an argument about it because I think Ruthie's taken as many, you know, teenagers do. She's taken a very sort of severe stance on this, that all ed gene editing is bad. And I tried to remind her that that's not ever what we said, that we said it's a very personal decision. It obviously very much depends on the condition and so in the case of something life-threatening, you would obviously want to do whatever you could to save a kid's life. But even for those things that aren't necessarily life-threatening, like albinism, it's a parent's decision or a parent's and a family's decision to do it. But Ruthie had a very hard time seeing that. Even for a life-threatening condition, she sort of couldn't help but fear the worst that CRISPR might bring out in our society. So it was interesting to see how she's become almost like an activist against gene editing now, which I think is somewhat understandable and somewhat is a product of, of her age. But it's kind of interesting to have that conversation with her now and to think about it. So anyway, that's a very long-winded answer, but we would not today, nor would we ever have, um, you know, since the time that it's been possible, considered gene editing her. What I've said all along is if she ever came to me or to us and said, hey, guys, I want to be able to see normally. And if there is a world in which we could offer that to her, we would most one certainly 100% do that, that she's at a stage now where she's an, a, effectively an adult and she can, she can make that decision for herself. I'll tell you one last thing, which is kind of interesting, which is she, um, one of the features of her albinism is she has nystagmus. So her eyes beat back and forth horizontally, which she doesn't notice, but obviously you can see it. And, uh, we didn't know this, but it affects her visual acuity, which is, makes sense, right? That if your eyes aren't always focused, that you're not going to see as well. We went to see a new ophthalmologist over the summer, and he said that there's this experimental surgery that they can do, which sounds kind of crazy, where they go and they they cut the optic, uh, the the uh, whatever they're called, what are the muscles, the extraocular oh. muscles, and uh -huh. then they just reattach them. All they do is they cut them and reattach them. And in some number of people that cures the nystagmus and they can make the visual acuity get better. 
And so I sort of said to Ruthie, I was like, wow, this is great. This is like amazing. You can, you might be able to drive a car and it, you know, it'll mean you don't have to struggle so much to read and get headaches and do all the things that, you know, and she had none of it. She was like, that's cheating. I will not do that. Wow. She felt like it was cheating for her to improve her visual acuity um, and wow. refused to even consider it. She is an amazing kid. She's a she's an amazing kid in, in all sorts <laughs> of ways. And by the way, I have another, I'm reminded all the time that I end up talking about Ruthie a lot, but I have this other amazing daughter who I have to mention because Mina, who's my 19 year old kid, is is equally amazing. She just was not born with albinism, so she doesn't get as much attention. I'm trying to be a good dad to both girls. No, you are a wonderful dad to both. I've been talking to Ethan Weiss, a wonderful dad of two amazing daughters whom he'd be happy to see become physicians if that's what they want, though he hopes we can revamp the incentives in the healthcare system before they get there. From his early days as a flailing medical student smitten with mouse genetics, Ethan has become an expert on metabolic disorders and thrombosis and a wise expatriate of both academic medicine and the social media pantheon. Ethan, thank you for joining me and sharing your wisdom.